Good evening and welcome to January 3rd, 1941. I'm Henry Chop, your host. And that was a Friday back in 1941. And as such, we are going to do a couple special things. I will tell you about that in just a second. Let me give you a couple reminders real quick. First off, if you enjoy old time radio programs, subscribe to this channel and click on that bell icon to get notifications. And also, if you want to know more about what was going on in the world on this date, January 3rd, 1941, go check out our uh, other channel that uh, is a companion channel to this one. It is uh, the World War II newspaper channel where, well, it's just like it sounds. I read the newspaper to you, the morning newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, because I'm from the Chicago area. So go check out that newspaper and it will give you a wonderful, wonderful uh, point of view of what was going on in the world on this specific date. What was going on in the world, uh, what was going on in national news, even what was going on in local news and sports. Uh, which is always interesting. I think you will find the crime news even even fascinating as we go from uh, uh, beginning to end, crime to punishment, as uh, Dragnet used to say. Uh, as many times as I can, I will start the crime news by uh, reading the uh, actual crime when it happens, and then when there's updates, such as an arrest, a confession or, well, back in 1940, of course, the, a lot of times they did the confessions the Chicago way, right? You guys know what I mean, right? <laughs> right? And uh, then you go to trial and we uh, many times read the trials if they're uh, updated there. And then finally, if it was a uh, death sentence, you will get the uh, death sentence and the appeals and finally the sentence carried out. So uh, lots of interesting stuff uh, in those uh, newspaper readings. I think you will find that uh, pretty cool stuff if you're into, uh, well, into sociology or into uh, history. It's a uh, great thing. Well, now let me tell you what we have coming up. Well, like I said, we're going to uh, listen to the number one song of the week. We're going to watch a movie serial, The Green Hornet Strikes Back, Chapter 2 in that and then we're going to keep our adventure hats on as we listen to the adventures of Superman, Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. Then we're going to move on to a, a uh, music program, Yiddish Melodies in Swing. <laughs> yes, you heard me right, Yiddish Melodies in Swing. I wonder, now, if you follow the newspaper, you will know that uh, ASCAP was on strike at this time. And I wonder if this program came about as a result of that strike, uh, what the strike generally entailed, and you can hear that in detail on the newspaper uh, channel, was that uh, any new music produced by ASCAP would be banned from radio play, and uh, only traditional music in the public domain or via BMI would be allowed on the air. And, uh, well, a lot of Yiddish melodies were in public domain, so uh, they might have jazzed them up quite a bit to and put them on this program. So uh, it, it's a it's an interesting program, and the music is pretty good. I, I enjoyed it uh, when I listened to it in the pre-show. And then we ha it runs about uh, uh, 18 minutes long, by the way. Then we have the Lone Ranger and Rustler, Rustlers at the Rio Grande. So then we get back to a little more adventure again. And then we have Information, Please, that great quiz program. I kind of call it the Jeopardy of 1940. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a different concept. But it was a very highbrow, uh, highbrow program, asked really hard questions. And if you've been following the newspaper on the other channel, you might be able to get some of the topical questions that they ask on this. And uh, this uh, star, uh, well, not stars, the guest panelists on this episode are uh, Deems Taylor and Vincent Sheehan, and it's sponsored by Lucky Strike Cigarettes. The The uh, commercials are in there, so don't inhale too much. But they are fun to listen to, uh, aren't they? You get to hear how uh, uh, cigarettes were sold back in the day, how they made them sound good uh, back in 1941. So we have some great stuff. All of this stuff is dated January 3rd, 1941, which is a remarkable thing. Well, the movie serial isn't dated 19, uh, 
uh, January 3rd, 1941, but it was released in late 1940, in December 1940, so uh, that's kind of a cool thing. I plan on, uh, all through World War II, uh, uh, keep on progressing with movie serials, so you will get to see how they changed dur during uh, World War II uh, as far as how the war was marketed to children. Because believe it or not, the, the, the war was being marketed. You kind of hear it in some of... You don't you won't hear it that much tonight on the radio, but uh, as we move on, and we're already starting to hear it on certain programs, the uh, war... Well, at this time, the defense program being marketed to people. But as uh, the sale of defense bonds comes into effect that uh, later on in the year, you will really see a ramp up in, in uh, the uh, defense effort later to, to uh, become the war effort to be marketed quite a bit. And uh, it will be a very interesting listen, and I will get more into that as the time comes. All right, well, let's get things started. The number one song of the week well, it was a holdover. It was the same song that was number one last week. It's Artie Shaw and Frenessi. Thank you. 
send every available cutter to the aid of the Paradise. That's fine, and thanks very much. I hope you get all right. <laughs> Suffering snakes, Lowry. Do you see what I'm seeing? Look, Britt, there's Father. I'll join him. Britt Reed. Goodbye, Gloria. I'll see you later. And thanks. <laughs> Reed, my boy, are you all right? Hello. Oh, oh, oh gee. Oh, 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 sure, it is a sight for sore eyes to be seeing you. Nobody had any idea you were on that ship. Boy, is this a scoop for the summer, or is this a scoop? We come down here to get eyewitness stuff and find you on board packing a whole story. Yeah. Well, I'll dictate it on the way to the office. Hold this case until I'll hold the presses for an extra. Okay, Chief. Oh, oh Britt. How about a little exclusive story for myself while the kid's busy on the phone? All right. Cato, give him the story. Oh, but I, uh... Hello? Yes, Lowry. What's that? Mr. Reed on the Paradise. Well, is he all right? Oh, I'm so glad. And he wants the press's help for an extra. All right, I'll have the men in the composing room stand by. Tell Mr. Reed how delighted we are that he's back and safe. Get that story in right away, Lowry, and tell him to rush it. Yes, sir. Hello, Casey. Hello. I can't tell you how glad we are to have you back. Well, I'm certainly glad to be here. There are a number of things that need your attention, but I suppose you'd like to rest first. I'll straighten things out. Rest later. Well, well, Mr. Reed, it's quite a surprise to see you. We, we didn't expect you. We had no idea you were on the Paradise. How's Gunnigan? He'll be able to leave the hospital in a few weeks. That's fine. I'm glad to hear that. We need Gunnigan on this paper. Well, I believe you'll find that my services have been very satisfactory. The advertising has increased considerably. That's good, if it's the right kind of advertising. Uh, we're safe on that score. I had everything checked by Gunnigan. I, I consulted him daily. All right, Mr. Harper. I'll talk with Gunnigan tonight at the hospital. I'll see you in the morning. Well, very well, Mr. Reed. Uh, I'll see you in the morning. Good night. Good night. alive and back on the job. Harper has failed again. He insisted on sending Bordeen on a job he should have done himself. You know, Krogan, I never trust that guy Harper. I always figured that if he ever slipped up on a European lottery racket, he'd give the syndicate the double cross. You're right, Tower. It's up to you to take care of Harper. I understand. And I know exactly where he'll be hiding out. In that old house he inherited from his sister. Take Ringo with you. He's the best trigger man in town. I leave everything to you. Take the private elevator... And don't miss on this job. Cato, we have two very important jobs to do tonight. I understand, Mr. Britt. We will call on Mr. Harper. Oh, yes. And we'll deliver to the district attorney's home Bordine's confession that he killed Sweeney and the money he collected for turning in Kirk. Keep your eye on the house. I may need you. Don't tell her. Don't. It was just an accident we'd got back to America. It wasn't my fault. You know the penalty for failure, Harper. I have my orders for the chief. I have you covered. Reach. The green hut. Drop that gun. Got that gun, I say. 
Get Harper. Not so fast, Harper. Get down from there. You saved my life on it. Those crooks were going to bump me off. For what reason? Well, I found out too much about their rackets. Especially the lottery racket, which you've been handling for the syndicate. Well, I had nothing to do with the lottery racket. This is a confession from Bordeen that he killed Pat Sweeney. And this is part of the reward money he collected for turning in Kirk. I know all about you, Harper. And I'm cutting in on that European lottery racket. And a lot more that your syndicate is handling. Oh. Huh. So that's it. All right, Hunter. What's your proposition? First, I want you to give me a complete list of all the rackets the syndicate is handling. Well, they have a tie-up with all the important rackets in the country. And the lottery racket alone brings in about a million a month. You've come pretty close to it. Now come clean, Harper. What's the name of the outfit, and who's the head? Oh, I... I can't tell you that. Yes, you can. And I'm going to make you. But don't shoot. I'll... I'll... I'll tell you. The name of the... Are you all right? What happened to the other rat? I got his gun, but he escaped. Both of these men were killed? Harper was killed by that shot from the window. I used my gas gun on the other. Keep watch outside. They must have heard the shooting. Come on, Cato. We're going to the DA's office. We got part of what we came for. The food do the rest. Morning, boss. What do you think of my harbor story? Not so hot. Sit down. Who do the police think killed Harper? Well, they figured that the Hornet, by bumping off Harper, was getting even with the Sutler for offering a reward for his capture. Oh, by the same token, now that I'm back on the job, I suppose the Hornet will be after me, huh? That's what the district attorney thinks, and so does the police. By the way, what was your candid opinion of Harper? Boss, I always thought that Harper had some tie up with the racketeers. I'm afraid you're right. I want you to call on a friend of his, a Mr. J.E. Lynch. Lynch? I know him. He's a lawyer. He called here several times to see Mr. Harper. Tell him you won all the dope on the European lottery. Also, tell him that Harper was very careless about leaving his memorandum book around where it could be found. Also, I'm on my way. Case, is Axford there? No, Mr. Reed. When he comes in, tell him I want to see him. Yes? What? He might be bluffing. Give him a cross-exam and find out how much he really knows. Lynch says that Lowry, a Sentinel reporter, is in his office... Demanding all the dope on the European lotteries. That's bad. He says that Reed found a memorandum book containing a lot of information in the desk Harper was using at the Sentinel. That means that Brett Reed will start an investigation. And when that news out starts to investigate, he never stops. I'll stop him. How? I'll close all our lottery offices today. But that'll cut off a lot of revenue. It's the only way we can stop Reed's investigation. Yes? All right, admit that you were. And tell him that as Harper's attorney, you're closing all the European lottery offices today. Yes. I'd give a hundred grand to know just how much information was in that memo book concerning our enterprises. It might be worth a lot more than that. Holy crow, have I got a beat. I was over to see my friend, the district attorney, and what do you think happened? He made you his deputy. Yes, he did. No, no. But he told me that it is his own. Plenty of time for that. Sit down. I want some information. Yes. Do you know anything about the Colton Ammunition Company? Do I know? Didn't I lose me three months' salary buying a bunch of their worthless stock? You remember, Mr. Reed. They got a large order for shells from Europe. Oh, and then they floated a stock issue for money to expand their plant. Yes, and then a lot of serious accidents happened, and part of the building was destroyed. And the company went broke. And a lot of poor devils like me lost their shirts. Did Harper ever mention the Colton plant? Well, not in my hearing. But we did carry several half-column want ads for mechanics and machinists for the company that bought Colton's out. Oh, ho. 
And that might explain the note in this memo book that Harper was so careless to leave behind. And what does the note say? It says, word Colton want ads in manner to attract kind of men we can handle. By all the saints. Didn't I tell you, Casey, that Harper was tied up with the hooks? Michael, get your car. You and I are going out to the Colton plant to investigate the new setup. Sure, it's parked right across the street and rare to go. I'm here to see Mr. Foley, your superintendent. Have you an appointment? Tell him Brick Reed of the Sentinel is here to look over the plant. Call Foley on the phone. Is this the maintenance? This is the only entrance. And no one is allowed to enter but employees. All right. This way. Foley, I tell you, we can't allow this Reed to go snooping around the plant asking questions. He knows every ex-convict in the city. He'll recognize some of the workmen. Do you think he'll recognize you? Sure he would. And keep out of sight. I certainly will. Hello? This is Foley. Connect me with Krogan. Yes? What? Rit Reed? Yeah. Reed and his bodyguard axe, but are here to look over the plant. I let them through the gate. They're waiting in the guard's office. Well, don't let them go beyond your office. Tell them you have strict orders not to admit anyone to the plant but employees. This is my chance to dispose of Reed. It certainly is. Reed's attempt to investigate our Colton plant is further proof that Harper's book furnished him with a complete list of our enterprises. I'll stop Reed's investigation if it's the last thing I do. All right. Now, I tell you, Michael. Michael. Foley, if you don't let us go through your plant, I'm turning the whole thing over to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I've got my orders, and I'm going to enforce them. Who gives you your orders? The president of the company, Mr. Colton. Colton's all. Oh. He's still president, and besides, you're wasting a lot of my time. If you don't want to waste more time in the hospital, keep a silver tongue in your head. Michael. There they go. Pull out. We'll lay for him a dead man's curve. Well, just as sure as you're alive, the new setup now controlling the Colton plant is a bunch of saboteurs. I agree with you there. If a plug here, their car might go over that cliff. Keep your motor running. Here they come. The police, get going and step up. Uh, those murdering devils, I'd like to. You know, we're lucky to be alive, Michael. Those fellows would have finished us off if the police car hadn't come along chasing those speeders. Sure, I wish I had me automatic. Them crooks is likely to come after us again. You're right. Pull out and step on it. We can beat them back to town. And with half the workmen in our plant ex-convicts, and our storage vaults packed with bombshells for a foreign government, an FBI investigation wouldn't be any too healthy for us, would it? I'll say it wouldn't. All right, now listen. By this time tomorrow, the Colton plant will be just a big hole in the ground. What do you mean? For two months, I've been selling the Colton plant outright to Mr. Grinson, agent for the foreign government we've been making big shells for. You mean that Grinson's going to take over the Colton plant? He thinks he is. Lynch, our attorney, has been handling the deal. He's already been paid 400 grand in cash. Tonight, Grinson makes his final pay. 100 grand. At your house, Foley. Well, why my house? It's the most convenient place from which the foreign agent can mysteriously disappear. Tower will take care of that after Lynch receives his final payment. I'll see to that part of it. Then our pilot, Tanjis, will bomb the Colton plant in the air. After I remove the guards, of course. Okay, Krogan. Well, why destroy the plant? With this rigid investigation going on... Manufacturing large shells for a foreign government is too risky an enterprise even for our syndicate. Tonight, Cato, the Green Hornet is going to call on Mr. Foley, superintendent of the Colton ammunition plant. We will go to the Colton plant? No. We're going to Foley's home. It's ten miles out on the highway, north of the Red River drawbridge. 
Tonight, the Green Hornet strikes again. The amount is correct, Mr. Grinson. A hundred one thousand dollar bills. You have my receipt and bill of sale ready for me, Mr. Lynch? Here they are, sir, in perfect order. They're correct. And now, gentlemen, the coat and ammunition plant belongs to my government. An operation will be carried on, is it present? No. There'll be a drastic change in the personnel. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Good evening sir. Mr. Grinston. There's someone leaving. Shall I follow them? No. Wait here. Now I'll phone Krogan the good news. That'll be his signal to destroy the Colton plant. Now. Oh, you better use the phone in the hall. I'm expecting a long distance. A hundred grand. The final payment of a half a million on the Colton plant. The syndicate certainly cleaned up big on that deal. Yeah, considering the very low price we paid Colton for it. And after we put the plant on the skids. Keep your hands in the clear. The Green Hornet. Surprised to see me, eh? I'll take over that hundred grand, and you crooks are going to answer some important questions. Get over. Superman, champion of the weak and the oppressed, who came to Earth on the planet Krypton with physical powers far beyond those of mortal men, and who fights a never-ending battle against crime and injustice, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a large metropolitan newspaper. Superman, in the guise of Clark Kent, and Jimmy Olsen, are visiting the ranch of a wealthy Indian oil man called Comanche Joe. Many strange accidents have happened on the ranch, and each one has been preceded by the lonely cry of a coyote. As our last episode ended... Comanche Joe, convalescing from burns, sustained during a fire at the oil wells, and received a message saying that when the coyote howled three times, he would die. We find ourselves now in Comanche's bedroom at the ranch house. His brothers of the Comanche tribe are seated in a circle on the floor, beating drums to ward off evil spirits. Outside the house, many other Indians stand guard. But... Look there, Kent. The edge of the moon over Sugarloaf Mountain. 
Somehow, somehow I have a feeling my time has come. Comanche, I tell you, you're... Listen. There it is. Oh, uh, who it? That is the second time. When the coyote howls three times, I die. You've got to hold on to yourself. You mustn't let this thing get the better of you. It's no use, Kent. There's nothing we can do against this thing. When the coyote howls... I'm going to die, Kent. I'm going to die. Quiet. Won't do anyone any good to get excited. How will I die? How will death come for me? And why doesn't it come? The coyote has howled three times. It... Wait. Who put out the light in here? What's happening? The window. Someone, something has come through that window. I heard the glass. Wait. I know there's something in this room. A scream. Right outside my window. Come. We go. Where's Ken? Ken. Where's Ken? Right here, Comanche. Where have you been? Did you hear that scream? Yes, it came from right outside your window. We'd better see what caused it. Yeah. There, look. Uh-huh. Your men have gotten hold of someone. Someone lying on the ground outside your window. Oh, oh. It's an Indian brave. Oh. What could have happened to him? How was he doing so close to my window? Oh, we'll soon find out, I think. Oh. Yes, bring that man forward. Oh. Who is this man? We not know. Him not our tribe. Let me go. Let me go, you hear? No, he's not a member of the tribe. He's not even an Indian. Comanche, I think if you dig down beneath that war paint and that Indian costume, you'll find one of your cowboys, a man called Tex. Oh. Tex. Why, of course. Tex, what's the meaning of this? What were you doing outside my window? Why are you dressed like an Indian? I'll tell you anything. Anything you want to know. Just keep that thing away from me. Keep it away from me. What are you talking about? What thing? Whatever it was, come through that window at me. I was standing out here, looking in through the window, when sudden like the light inside went out. The next thing I know, this, this thing crashed through the window at me. It, it come right out of your room, through the window. Its hands went around my throat. I thought my neck was busted. I, I never did feel anything so strong before. Is that why you screamed? Yeah. I thought I was a corner sure. Something crashed through the window from my room. What could it have been? Eagle huh? in shape of man. What's that? In your room, we beat drum. We call spirit who save little laughing squirrel. We call spirit of eagle in shape of man. Spirit of Superman. Superman? Kent, do you... Do you think it might have been that... I'm afraid I don't put much stock in things like that, Comanche. What I'm more interested in knowing is what Tex was doing outside your window before this thing, whatever it was, hit him. Yes, you've got something there. All right, Tex. If you know what's good for you, you'll talk. I'll talk. Don't worry. I ain't taking no more chances, Comanche. I... Uh... Yes, you what? I was aiming to, to... You were aiming to kill Comanche, is that it? Kill him? I don't know. All I know is Rawson, give me this blowgun. Rawson? That, that blowgun? Let me see that blowgun. Oh, this is how Dusty met his death. You mean to say, Kent, that Dusty was killed with a blowgun? Yes. Just as you might have been killed if... if something hadn't happened to prevent it. Here, have a look. See, there's a small dart. Hardly more than a piece of thorn. No doubt coated with something deadly poison. That's why we found no wounds or other marks on Dusty's body. Rawson probably opened the window of the living room where we were standing at the time without our knowing it. And blew the small dart at Dusty. Just as Tex here was going to do with you. Why, you blasted murdering... I didn't know how to kill you. Rawson put me up to it. It was Rawson, I swear. Then it looks like the first thing we've got to do is to get Rawson. You, my brothers, some of you hold this man prisoner. The rest of you come with me. Come on, Kent. We're going to get our hands on Rawson and get to the bottom of this killing business right now. Open up in there, Rawson. Open up. All right, we'll have to break the door down. Lend a hand here, Kent. Okay, Comanche. Come on. Uh, he's not here. Uh, There's no one here. So I see. I wonder if he's... Oh, the devil, he's escaped. He must have heard of Texas capture and skinned off into the hills. But he's only got a 10 or 15 minute start, Comanche. That's true, but we could never find him in the mountains. Why? He's a good woodsman. He'll be covering his tracks all the way. Uh. Comanche become like pale face. Comanche forget what Indian know. What are you talking about, my brother? Us, your brothers. Us capture Rawson. But how? Even you couldn't follow the trail that Rawson's taken pains to cover up. Maybe he's got another idea, Comanche. He's so. Maybe it takes time. One day. Two days. 
Maybe more. But we get him. We get him. Are you sure? You wait. You see. Out of show. Out of show. Bent on following some plan of their own for the capture of Rawson, Comanche's Indian brothers leave him. Kent and Comanche return to the ranch house, where a surprise awaits them. Tumbleweed. Tumbleweed Jones. Hi, Comanche. Just arrived back here a little while ago. What's all the ruckus? I'll tell you about it later, but how did you get back here? Yes, and where's Jimmy Olsen? Why, he's the reason I come on back here tonight. The doctor says he's fit enough to be moved back to the ranch house tomorrow morning. But he says we'll have to use a gas buggy. Can't have the boy traipsing around on a horse. Well, I don't know how to operate one of them uh, gas buggy critters, so uh, I thought I'd get Comanche here or you can't to drive over for him tomorrow. Why didn't you telephone? Well, I wanted to get back here so as I could uh, finish up working on that bow and arrow set for Jim. Uh, have it ready for him when you bring him back here tomorrow. How about it, Kent? Will you drive over in the morning? I'll drive over tonight if you don't mind. I'm kind of a little anxious to see Jimmy again. I don't blame you. All right, Kent. We'll get the old buggy out and brush it off so you can drive over tonight. Meanwhile, off in the hills... Indian tom-toms begin to beat. All through the night, the strange drumming of the tom-toms is heard. The dawn breaks over the mountains. A weary and anxious Rawson rides alone through the wilderness. Mm, they've got me. Them Indians and their blasted drums have been circling me all night, throwing in on me closer and closer. I'm completely surrounded, surrounded by a circle of engines getting closer to me all the time. I'll never be able to get through. Well... There's only one thing to do. I'm heading for the cave. I've got a carbine and plenty of ammunition. I'll be able to hold them off for a while anyway. Maybe something will turn up. But if it don't, well, I'll get a lot of them before they get me. Get up there! Get up! Comanche, them drums has been beating all night and all morning. Yes, Tumbleweed. Now I know what my Indian brother meant last night when he said they'd capture Rawson in time. From the sound of those drums, they've got Rawson encircled. It won't be long before they'll have him. And uh, what you say, we ride on up there. I want to be there when they get their hands on Rawson. You say Rawson is in that cave? It's so, Comanche. Rawson in cave. Rawson, good shot. Him, him kill first man go near him. He's got the advantage, all right. The entrance to that cave isn't very large. No chance of getting in without Rawson getting the drop on you. Well, I'll have to chance it. Rawson's a good shot, but I may be able to get him before he gets me. I reckon is how you got that wrong, Comanche. Now, wait a minute, Tumbleweed. I got to settle with Rawson for what he did to little Jimmy. This is my job, Comanche. The man who goes in there after him, Tumbleweed, probably won't come out alive. I know that. But somebody's got to go in after him, and it's going to be me. Now, hold on, Tumbleweed. I've been the cause of all this trouble. We're wasting time, Comanche. We'll talk to Corn. Whoever wins goes in after Ross. Isn't that okay with you? All right. I'll talk to Corn. I'm calling heads, Comanche. Heads it is. Now, Tumbleweed. Don't you worry about me, none. I've been itching for this chance for a long, long time. you better take my carbine. Carbine? I don't have no truck with firearms. If I can't put an arrow through Rawson's heart, I don't deserve to come out alive. Rawson. Rawson, can you hear me? I hear you all right. I'm to give you one chance for your life. Come on out of that cave and come quiet, and you'll get a trial below. You want me to come away? You'll have to come in and hit me. That's what I was hoping. Rawson, here I come. Bow and arrow in hand, Tumbleweed Jones moves slowly, carefully toward the entrance to the cave. Rawson, carbine ready, waits to put a bullet through his heart. Can Jimmy Olsen's friend possibly emerge victorious? And what can Superman, unaware of Tumbleweed's danger, do to help? Be sure to hear the next thrilling episode of our story with Superman. And remember, tune in the next thrilling installment of the transcription feature, Superman. Up in the sky, look! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics magazine. Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Wave the flag for Hudson High, boys. Show them how we stand. Every shark can be champions, known throughout the land. Wheaties, breakfast of champions.
champions bring you the thrilling adventures of Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. Hey, Ken! Come on out here in the ice. Let's get some practice. Hey, Ken, did you hear me? Take off that overcoat and get going. Go on and play by yourself. It's too cold for hockey today. Oh, I'm almost freezing. And I'm going home the minute I get these skates off. <laughs> and you were the guy who was going to show me what a good hockey player you are. Well, you don't even know how to keep warm in cold weather. Hey, listen, Ken. Did you have any breakfast this morning? No, I was in too much of a hurry. Promised you I'd meet you here at 8.30, so I skipped breakfast. Besides, I don't like the kind of breakfast my mother gives me in the cold weather. Ah, no breakfast, huh? Now, maybe that's the reason why you're feeling cold. Don't you know a hockey player needs a good breakfast in the morning? Now, why don't you eat Wheaties like I do? A good big bowl of Wheaties with some milk and fruit. Well, what do you mean, Wheaties? That's the kind of breakfast dish you eat in the summer. My mother says I need a hot breakfast in the wintertime. Hi there, fellas. Did I hear somebody arguing about breakfast? I'll say you did. Ken here says you got to have a hot breakfast in winter. And I tell him you can go right on eating a dish like Wheaties if you want to. Who's right? You are, 100%. Wheaties are just as good as a hot cooked breakfast dish for helping to keep you warm. You see... A large serving of Wheaties hands you a big supply of fuel energy units. Well, what are fuel energy units, anyway? Well, they're a kind of nourishment you burn up in your body, just like a furnace burns up other kind of fuel. As long as your breakfast gives you enough of these fuel energy units, it doesn't matter whether you take that breakfast right out of the package or heat it on the stove. The heat of cooking doesn't count for a thing. But listen, you can feel the heat in a hot-cooked dish. Sure you can. But that kind of heat disappears in practically no time. Now, what you really want in cold weather is a breakfast like Wheaties, one that's rich in fuel energy units along with other kinds of nourishment an athlete needs. I'll bet that's it, Ken. If you eat Wheaties like I do, you won't mind the cold so much. Come on over to my house and we'll have some Wheaties now. Okay, fellas, and I can promise you that you're going to have a swell meal. I wish every fellow and girl in America could know what a real champion winter training dish Wheaties are. And you're mighty lucky to get all the Wheaties you want this time of year. And now, Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Jack and Uncle Jim have just salvaged the precious uranium-235 from Professor Loring's sunken yacht off a submerged reef in the Sulu Sea. With the help of Billy, Betty, and the Filipino Michelle, they have hoisted the heavy box to the deck of the spindrift, which is anchored above the sunken yacht. Jack is lashing the valuable box to the deck cleats, and Uncle Jim and the others are anxiously watching the approach of the power schooner Black Shark. On board the Black Shark, a Shepato and Blackbeard and others of their crew have been following Uncle Jim to steal the precious uranium. And now, while the shimmering horizon of the pseudo sea shows no sign, no help in sight... The crew of the Spindrift is about to up anchor and sail away from the submerged reef. Listen. There, Uncle Jim. The box of uranium is all lashed down on deck. We may have to cut those lashings in a hurry, Jack. If the black shark tries to board us, that uranium goes overboard the instant they set foot on our deck. But what are we going to do now, Uncle Jim? The black shark's getting terribly close. We're going to hoist sail and leave the submerged reef, Betty. We'll try and prevent them from boarding us if we possibly can. Uncle Jim, I have a corking idea, if it'll work. What is it, Jack? Most of this submerged reef comes to within three or four feet of the surface. But this stretch here, where we cut across the reef, has about seven feet of water over it. We know we can cross the reef there because we've done it. But jumping crickets, Jack, we're already across the reef. Yeah, of course we are, Billy. My idea is to go back to the other side of the reef and cross it again. But what good will that do, Jack? Here's the idea, Billy. We can cross this stretch of reef, but the black shark can't. She draws too much water. She'll pile up if she tries to. I follow you, Jack. Jiminy, I don't follow you. What's the rest of your plan? Listen, Billy. We'll cut across the reef now and go back to meet the black shark. Holy smoke, they're going back to meet the black shark? That's just what we'll do. But when we get halfway to her, we'll pretend to change our mind. We'll turn around and sail away from it. Oh, we'll... I see, Jack. We'll sail back to this reef. They'll chase us. We'll sail across the reef, and they'll hit the reef. That's it exactly, Betty. They don't know where the reef is. You can't see it until you're almost to it. 
And they'll think there's deep water here because they'll see us sailing right on through the reef. Jumpin' Cricket, that's a crackerjack idea. Do you think it'll work, Uncle Jim? It's certainly worth a try, Billy. We know we can't escape the black shark under sail. But when we come back to the reef, how will we know the exact spot to sail across it, Jack? Well, we'll drop a buoy of some sort overboard to mark it, Betty. Then we'll sail back on our original compass course until we see the marker. Well, come on. What are we waiting for? The black shark is coming right along. We'll leave our stern anchor here to hold the marker in place. Billy, make a life preserver fast to the stern anchor line and throw it overboard, line and all. Jack, you and Michelle hoist the mainsail, and we'll swing to our bow anchor. Come on, Michelle. Let's get that mainsail up. See, senor. The tail's already out of stop, Michelle. I'll take the throw halyard. You take the peak. Ready? Me ready, senor Jack. Then up we go. Haul away. That very smart idea you have, Senor Jack. We fooled you, Bato, huh? We no let him catch me. We won't let him catch anybody, Michelle. And he won't get the uranium, either. He'll be stuck high and dry on this reef while we're sailing away. We got hurry, huh? Black shark, not body way. Well, just about half time, Michelle. There, the throat's high enough. Twice the peak a little higher. Atta, boy. Now make your halyard fast. The life preserver is made fast in its overboard, Uncle Jim. It makes a swell marker. That's fine, Billy. Now you and Michelle hoist the fossil. Betty, you hoist the jib. Jack, you lend me a hand with the, the bow anchor. We'll get it up and get underway. I hope this anchor isn't followed on the coral reef, Uncle Jim. Mm, if it is, we'll cut the line and let her stay there, Jack. The black shark's getting pretty close. Yeah, we'll soon see if she's followed. All set, Uncle Jim? All set, Jack. Lay hold. Heave. Uh, and she's coming, Uncle Jim. She broke bottom. Keep on pulling, Jack. Yo ho, heave ho. Yo ho, heave ho. Get stop, Uncle Yo-ho, Jim. We're underway. Heave-ho. We're moving. I'll go back and hold the wheel. Yo-ho, the boat will come up. I'll help Yo-ho, with the anchor. We have to be back too, huh? There. She's broken water. She's almost up. Everyone lay hold and we'll haul the anchor on deck. Lay hold. There. Now I'll go back and take the wheel from Betty, Jack. You and Billy trim in those sheets. Michelle, you stay here and lash down the anchor. She got me doing Betty, Pete. I'll take the full sheet, Jack. You trim in the main sheet. Okay, Billy. How flat do you want to trim, Uncle Jim? Trim, trim an easy sheet, Jack. The wind will be dead a beam when we head back for the black shark. How's this, Uncle Jim? A little more, Jack. There. That's just about right. Stand by. I'm going to come about. Look sharp, Jack. We're about to cut across the reef. See if we've got enough water under us. This is the right place, Uncle Jim. We've got about seven feet under us. I hope you'll get right, Jack. We don't want to be stuck now. We're all right, Billy. See? We're over the shallowest part now. I'll bet we've got a good foot to spare. I'm going to head right for the black shark, Jack. Take an accurate compass reading for me. Okay, Uncle Jim. We're heading exactly north, one half east. Remember that, Jack. When we turn around and start back, we want to bear south, one half west. Well, right, sir. Well, how will you know when to turn around, Uncle Jim? We don't want the black shark to catch up with us before we get back to the reef. It won't be long before we turn back, Billy. The black shark's making close to ten knots through the water now. We're only making four knots in this light breeze, so she'll be overtaking us at the rate of six knots, or about seven land miles an hour. Suppose we can't pick up the marker when we hit the reef, Uncle Jim? We've got to pick up that marker, Betty. If we don't, we'll pile up on the reef ourselves. That reef's a mile long, and most of it's very close to the surface. But I can't see the marker at this distance. I see it, Betty. But I wouldn't see it if I didn't know what it was. Well, that's good. We don't want it to be too plain. If the black shark saw it in time, they'd smell a mouse. They wouldn't follow us. But they'll know there's a reef there anyway, Jack. They could see us through their binoculars and see that we were diving for the uranium. But they won't know how deep the water is over the reef, Betty. They'll think they're safe if they follow us. Hand me the binoculars, Jack. Let's see what's going on aboard the black shark. Here they are, Billy. I'll bet you Beto and Blackbeard are wondering why we're heading towards them. Well, what are they doing, Billy? Can you see? There's someone at the bow watching us through his binoculars, Betty. Great guns, but the black shark is moving right along. You want to see that bone in her teeth? Let's fly the gypsy, Jack. It's time for us to come about and start back. Aye, aye, Uncle Jim. She's free. Finally, we're coming about. All right, Jack. Come in your main seat. Oh, I hope we're heading back in the right direction. We are, Betty. Our course is south, one half west, plus a quarter point for drift to lower. Jack, if they don't follow us over the reef, if they don't get stuck on the reef themselves, they'll board us just like pirates. Now, look at Michelle. He's keeping calm. And if Shepardo catches him, there's no telling what they won't do to him. Oh, Betty's not feeling calm. How are you, Michelle? Me trust Senor Jack. Me trust Senor Uncle Jim. They very smart man. They fool, Chipato. They don't let Chipato catch me. That's a talking, Michelle. You saved Jack and Uncle Jim from the shark, and now we'll save you from Shepardo. But the black shark will catch us before we get back to the reef. She's getting so close. 
I can see everyone aboard her. There's one thing I'm certain of, Betty. I'm certain that as long as this breeze holds, we'll get to the reef before the black shark does. Can you see the marker now, Jack? I can't see a sign of it. We won't see it until we're almost there, Betty. Hand me the glasses, Billy. I'll see if I can pick it up. Okay, here you are, Jack. Gee, I hope we'll be able to find it when we get there. I can see it now, Billy. We're heading just right, Uncle Jim. That's fine, Jack. We'll be to the reef in just a moment now. Suppose the black shark does hit the reef, Uncle Jim. Suppose they have to take to their boats. Will the crew be in any danger? They won't be in a bit of danger in this calm sea, Billy. They can get to one of the islands in their lifeboats with no trouble at all. They got one lifeboat with engine, Captain Fairyfield. Then we surely won't have to worry about their safety, Billy. Look sharp now, everybody. We're getting close to the reef. Well, I'll see where you are. Why, I can see the marker. See it, Betty? Just off the starboard bow. We want to hit the reef about a hundred yards to the left of that marker, Billy. We're headed straight for the right place. Yeah, it's getting shallow, Uncle Jim. I can see bottom now. Don't be alarmed, Betty. We know there's enough water for us at this point. If there's not, we'll soon find it out. We're almost to the reef. We're passing over it, Billy. See? It's getting deep again. And the black shark is right behind us. Look, I can see Blackbeard at the bow. And there's your paddle with him. And Lazaro, too. Uh, they're worried about something. They know there's a reef here somewhere. They keep coming much longer, Jack. We've done the trick. Wouldn't you think they'd have the sense to slow down, Uncle Jim? At the speed they're going, it'll take them a long time to stop. And it won't do them any good just to turn. they hit another part of the reef. They're so intent on catching us, they aren't paying much attention to the reef, Billy. They think it's safe enough to follow us. Look, Uncle Jim, Blackbeard sees the reef. He's pointing it out to Chappelle. Why, they signal full speed reverse. Look at the water turn up at their stern. They'll never be able to stop in time now. Oh, oh, there they go. Oh, oh, they struck the reef. Well, I'll say they struck it. Look, Jack. The bow of the black shark has lifted high up out of the water. They've come halfway across the reef, Billy. Look, Uncle Jim, they'll never be able to get off. It wouldn't do them any good to get off, Jack. The bottom of the black shark must be ripped from stem to stern. If she slid off the reef, she'd sink like a stone. Are they in any danger, Uncle Jim? Not a bit, Betty. They can take to their lifeboats and get to safety any time they want to. But take a good look at the black shark, all of you. You've seen the last of her. The next typhoon will wash her down to the bottom of the ocean. That's where she ought to have been long ago, Uncle Jim. And now, what next? We're going to Mindanao, Jack. We're going to stop by at Zamboanga to deposit this uranium with the U.S. Army at Pettit Barracks. And then, we're going into Mindanao to find Professor Loring and the White Sultan of Mindanao. And so, while the crew of the Black Shark are taking to their lifeboats, Jack and the others are sailing for Mindanao. Half of their task is done. But a still harder task lies ahead. They must find the missing Professor Loring, held captive by some Moro tribe in the interior of Mindanao. And they must find out something about the legendary white sultan of Mindanao and locate those rich deposits of uranium that lie in the interior. Impenetrable swamps, trackless jungles, hostile Moros all lie in their path. Strange adventures await them. And you won't want to miss a single exciting episode of all this. So listen in, all of you, at this same time next Monday for the first of a series of thrilling adventures in Mindanao, the wild island of the fierce Moros, with Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Now, be sure you've got plenty of Wheaties to last you over the weekend. You'll want them for breakfast in the morning and for a quick lunch any time you get hungry. Ask Mother right now to order the big orange and blue package with the two famous General Mills trademarks, Wheaties and Breakfast of Champions. Have you tried Wheaties? They're whole wheat with all of the brand. This is Franklin McCormick saying goodbye till Monday for General Mills, makers of Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions, who have just presented another episode of Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. Oh, just buy Wheaties, the best breakfast food in the land. Wave the flag for Hudson High, boys. Show them how we stand. Ever shall our team be chance. Hey, guys, if you are fascinated by the 1930s and 1940s and are interested in learning a little bit about what was going on with the headline in the thumbnail to this video, check out our other channel, the World War II newspaper channel. Uh, check it out and subscribe to it. I think you will find that fascinating. The
Manischewitz Company, world's largest matzo baker, happily presents Yiddish Melodies in Swing. And now, dancing in on a December downbeat, your favorite old Yiddish folk song, Fizzle in the modern, metal manner of Yiddish Swing. singer of sweet ballads, Jan Bart. Jan sings the beautiful melody entitled Septa, Sweetheart. So many lonely hearts are breaking, hoping no man will come the way. The day when love will come to stay. I might have still been blue and friendless, and just as bad as they, I feel. Some lonely nights would have been endless if you hadn't said the word, I love you, dear. You can be sweetheart. Each waking moment, I think of you. I thank you, sweetheart, for giving all your love to me. Heart, mine, I've put a lot in me to be. Heart mine, the pale face is in its heart. Heart mine, it is not to leave a flea. It's a dank dear heart mine, but it can sleep in heart to heart. I 
Jewish Hour. The makers of Tuxedo Brand Cheese present Yiddish Swing. Jumping into the last summer Sunday of August 1940, your ancient Yiddish folk song swings forward a couple of giant centuries. Into the rhythmic calendar of Yiddish swing. The makers of Edelstein's Tuxedo Brand Cheese proudly present two juicers in four times, the dairy maids, Alan Chester, Sam Medoff, and the dairy smooth orchestra, in Yiddish swing. Yiddish swing. The dairy maids, Alan Chester, Sam Medoff, and the dairy smooth orchestra in Yiddish swing. And now in syncopated Augustian splendor, 
The dairy smooth orchestra sends royal rhythms rocking in the melodic kingdom off the beaten cadenza. It's Benka Haim. my tam. How do I look? How do I look? First say hello. Hello, girl. You look terrible. Oh, yeah? Maybe I ought to go away again. Oh, we were only kidding. You really look swell. So stick around while we ring the bell. Our dear little dairy maid, Agazinta Vey, stomp sweetly with my Nyusha Mabla. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
In the carefree hours of a summer afternoon when hearts are young and gay, a romantic song is both befitting and beautiful. Alan Chester now sings the ever popular Ich hab dich lieb. I love you. I give you the heart that you've broken to keep as a token. Cast it aside with the others and say in a jest, another conquest. You knew that I'd never deceive you. I tried not to grieve you. You must be looking for something that I don't possess. Then there is no reason for staying, for hoping, for praying. I should have known better than trying to better a spirit of With the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high yo silver, the Lone Ranger. was the first great industry in the western United States. But the lives and property of the ranchers were in constant danger from outlaws and hostile Indians. It was not until the masked rider of the plains started his fight for justice that cattle rustlers were driven from the range country and the West became safe for honest men and women. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Sam Curdy's cattle were grazing peacefully on the buffalo grass that covered the rangeland. They were Texas longhorns, sleek and well-fed, just about the best cattle in the territory. It was late at night, and the herd was watched by only two range riders. That you, Regan? Yeah, Jeff. Pretty quiet tonight, isn't he? Get around the other side of the herd, Regan. I'm riding this side. I thought I saw a light flickering over this way. Come over to ask if you I ain't seen nothing. It was right up that there bluff behind you. I figured that... Now I'd... get back to where you belong. I was just going to tell you I about... ain't seen nothing, and there ain't nothing. Regan, suppose them cattle takes a notion to wander right where you're supposed to be. Jeff, I wouldn't have come unless I figured them cattle wasn't in no danger stampede. Hmm? I never can tell. I'll get. All right, I'm slow. 
doggone curious, that fella. What's up there, you fellas? Is he no night for wandering? Come on, there, get <laughs> I reckon he don't suspect nothing. Come on, horse. Up that hill. Come on, boy. Steady now. Steady. Come on, fella. Worcester. Worcester. Right here, Jeff. Well, right he's seen a light. You ought to be more careful, Worcester. They get it. We get business to attend to. The sooner we stampede Curtis Kettle past Rock Gulch, the sooner the boys can cut out a couple of hundred head for wrestling. Already, any time you say, Worcester. No shooting and no yelling, Savvy. Ain't going to be easy getting them steers on the prod. Hey, <laughs> it? I got something right here in my saddlebag. Huh? We use this. There won't be no need for us to shoot or raise a holler. Hey. Worcester, that smells like wolf. Yeah, Jeff. It's wolf scent, all right. Got it from an engine. Well, hold there. Stay there, you coyotes. There, you see. Your horse got the smell of wolf. Just figure what'll happen when them long horns start to get it. Yeah, you hear him? The wind's carrying the scent toward him already. That's the right smart idea, Worcester. Yeah. Jeff, you take this here, Sack. I got another one. Now we'll just hit for the kennel. The closer we get, the wilder they'll get. They'll stampede without us making a sound. Uh, if this doggone horse don't run away first. Come on. Let the kennel get the smell of wolves. They're moving. Swing their sack toward them. Spread the wolf scent. They're getting it. Pass it. Get up. <laughs> Pretty slick scheme, ain't it? Make him won't know what makes him so nervous. Come on, keep going. <laughs> Boy, easy there. Get back. Get back there, you action plum loco. What's that to be scared of? Get back. Back, you ornery longhorns. What's making you act up? The... Ain't no use. I can't turn them back. Here they come. Come on, horse. We gotta run for it. Get traveling, horse. It's a stampede. I gotta ride for my life. Stop, Tonto. Them cattle. Tonto, it's a stampede. They're heading this way. That's right. We go fast, Tonto. Wait. Huh? You hear that, Kimasabi? There's a rider out in front of the stampede. Uh, me hear him. He sounds tired, Tonto. Come along. We've got to see if he needs help. Get him up, Scout. Come on, Silver. Head for the stampede. Hello! Him not hear you. Look, Tonto. The moon's coming out through the clouds. Uh, him plenty close. Faster, Silver. Faster. Hello! Fall down. This horse had a gopher hole. Come on, Silver. Look out for them Get set. Swing up behind me. Him ready. Give me a hand. Up. Hang on. You'll never make a chance, Elder. Better let me go and save yourself. Keep your hold. Fast, Dick. Keep up, Tommy. Then I'll come fast. Come on, Silver. Run for your life, old Get boy. Get on. Let's go. <laughs> we sure done all right with them cattle, Jeff. Yonder's the ranch, Worcester. Reckon I better amble. The boys cut out a full 200 head. Changing the brand on it by now. You figure Regan got away? <laughs> he had them longhorns right behind him, sure enough. Maybe they stampeded over him. But don't make no difference anyways. We had the cattle cut out while he was still riding in front of the stampede. You better head back for the boys. Yeah. I'll ride up to the ranch and give Sam Curdy the sad news. Yeah. <laughs> sad for him. Make it look good, Jeff. Sure. Sam won't suspect a thing, not a thing. As soon as we get them cars across the border, you'll get your divvy. Adios. Adios, Worcester. Come on, horse. Pull leather. Make it look good. Yeah. Hey, Sam. Sam Curdy. Hey, Sam, wake up. Turn out. It's me. It's Jeff. Sam, where in town nation are you? Where's Sam? Yes, that you? Yeah, there's trouble. Where's Sam? Well, he's asleep, of course. What on earth is he Then roust him out. We gotta get going. Such a ruckus. What's it going? Jeff. 
Something gone wrong with the steers? Trouble, Sam. How come you're here? You ought to be out range right The herd broke loose. What a stampede. They went on the prod. Plum loco. Got going and I couldn't stop them. Stay right here. I'll pull on my boots and get right out. Jeff. Yes, ma'am? How come you're alone? What about Regan? Well, Regan was on the other side of the herd, Mrs. Curdy. The cattle stampede headed straight for him. Oh, you think something happened to him? I don't know. I couldn't see. There's plenty of dust and the moon went under a cloud. I sure hope Regan got clear. Them longhorns got plenty sharp hoofs. Send the things, Ma. I'm riding out with Jeff. Oh, look for young Regan, Sam. This way, Jeff. Grab me horse out of the corral. You better make it too, Sam. Huh? Well, my horse is plumb tucked out. Oh, sure, I clean forgot. Sure, your horse must have wore out. Riding after stampeding cattle ain't no picnic. And then pouring for the ranch at a gallop. Sure, you put that cayuse into the corral and we'll get us fresh horses. Shed that saddle and give me a rope. The sooner we get horses, the sooner we can take after them longhorns. It's getting light. Them cattle sure cover plenty of ground. Went way past Rod Gulch, Sam. Hey, you hear that? The cattle. Yeah. Must be right past this clump of mesquite. Hey, over this way. Over here. You hear that? It's Regan. Hey, Regan, that's you. Mr. Cuddy. Come on, Jeff, that's him. Mr. I sure am glad to see you. These here local steers have been rambling all night. Jeff, you figure what's started? Well, well, nearly an idea, Regan. Just got to bellin' and millin' around, and off they took. Glad to see you safe, son. They come mighty near getting caught, Mr. Curdy. But a fellow... And as for the herd, it looked... Hey. Huh? Jeff, Regan, there's something wrong. That herd looks heap smaller than it ought to be. Well, Sam, I don't looks think... Looks like plenty is missing. I Gosh, wonder if Mr. something... Mr. Curdy, they sure do look thinned out, now that you mention it. Rustlers. Now, Sam... Rustlers, I tell you. That's what it must be. And by granny, I got a good idea where they're headed. Where? Rock Gulch. It's the only spot they could have cut out any cantle. Well, now, maybe they strayed off they strayed and they... nothing. A couple hundred head. I tell you, them cattle was cut off deliberate. And I tell you, it's Rock Gulch where it was done. Get your horse, Regan. My horse is lame, Mr. Curdy. Step smack into a gopher hole. Lame, huh? All right, then you stay here and keep your eyes on the herd. I don't reckon they'll go on the prod again. They plumb water or frazzle. Nevertheless, you stay. Jeff, we're heading for Rock Gulch. Well, if you say so, but I But don't... nothing. Rock Gulch leads right to the ford across the Rio Grande. Right smack into Mexico. It's rustlers, I tell you, and we're heading after them. Come on, boy. There they are, Kimosabe. Uh, rustler. Across the Rio Grande into Mexico. Them change brand now. Keep low, Tonto. That's right. The sun's coming up. I don't want them to see us over the top of this hill. Tall fella boss, huh? Remember what he looks like, Tonto. Now back to the horses. Mm. How many cattle there? At least 200 head, Tonto. We go back across Rio Grande now? Well, this is Mexican territory, Tonto. Nothing we can do here would be within the law. Boss rustler, not Mexican. He'll cross the border again soon, Tanta. That's the time to trap him. You think maybe... Yes? Him fella we help and stampede. Regan? Maybe him rustler, too. No, Tanta. I'm sure Regan has nothing to do with it. Plenty of cowhands rustle their own cattle. Regan was running ahead of that stampede. He couldn't be in with the rustlers. But Regan mentioned another rider. Uh-huh. A rider who should have been with that herd. And yet he wasn't. A cowhand named Jeff. Steady, Silver. Oh, good. Oh. We'll head back across the river into Texas Territory. Curdy's cattle have been rustled. Now I want to find out where Jeff is and what he knows about it. All right, Silver. Back for him. Get him up, Scott. Where's a marked tail? Look at Jeff. Yes, Sam. Doggone armory cattle stealing rustlers. They cut out them prime heads and moved them right across the Rio. Reckon that's what started the stampede. Sure, Russell's that what? I'll pull up. Ain't no use chasing them into Mexican territory. Just two of us ain't enough to put up a fight. Yeah, it's a doggone shame, Sam. You sure you didn't see anyone last night, Jeff? Well, there you so. It beats me how they started the stampede without shouting and yelling. Must be them same rustlers that's been taking cattle off every ranch in this section. Dad read him. If I had a posse of men around, I... What's that? Hoofs. Come from the other side of the river. Hey, where are you going? Find you, sir, Cactus. They ain't seen us yet. Well, what are you figuring on doing? Get your shooting iron. Must be a couple of them rustlers coming back. We'll give them a warm welcome. What's that? They're coming down the slope now. But that can't be... 
Well, one of them hombres is wearing a mask. Yeah, mask man the engine. Ain't nobody wears a mask unless he's up in the something ornery. Yeah, I thought it was... Hmm? Oh, nothing. Nothing, Sam. Reckon you're right. Them's the rustlers showing up. Right now. Either come across the river. We can get away. Don't shoot. But Sam, I'm I want said... these hombres in my own way. Just keep your guns out, ready to shoot if they don't stop. They're right close. Yeah. All right, you sneaking coyotes, reach for the sky. Steady, Silver. Yeah. Don't make no play for your guns. This ain't no ambush, mister. You and the engine are rustlers, that's what. And you know what that means. Come sundown, you'll be swinging at the end of a rope, ready for the buzzards. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger story. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. To continue our story, when the Lone Ranger and Tonto returned to the Texas side of the Rio Grande after following the rustlers, they were ambushed by Curdley and his foreman, Jeff. Curdley, certain that the masked man and the Indian were rustlers, locked them up at his ranch and headed for the town to get the sheriff. Oh, Miss Curdley, now don't you fret. Them two armies are locked up good and tight, and there ain't no way for them to get out. Oh, it's sure taking Sam a long time to fetch a sheriff. It's yeah, sure a right smart piece to town. Ought to be back around sunset. I sure wish it took them into town instead of leaving them here on the range. A lot less likely they can get away here. Hey, Jeff. Huh? Regan, what are you doing here? I told you to stay with them steers. I brought my horse in the corral, Jeff. Got to get another one that ain't lean. Well, get it and get back. Sure, sure. Sandy's riding day hurt on him. Say, what's this he was saying about Sam and you catching up a couple of them rustlers? Yeah, Regan. We got him locked up waiting for the posse. And I wish we didn't. Shucks, don't figure there'd be any trouble. Now get your horse and get moving, Regan. Gosh, Jeff, you don't have you to You heard me, get. All right, all right. Oh, I almost forgot. What? Mitt Worcester over near the ranch line. Said he'd like to see you. Could you spare him a minute? Oh, Worcester, huh? Are you going, Jeff? Uh, sure. Now, don't worry about them two hombres, ma'am. They ain't getting out. I'll see Worcester, and I'll be right back. What have you got here, Jeff? Now, keep your shoot on, Worcester. Ringing just told me you wanted to see me. What about those two hombres? You heard? Sure, I heard. They come back across the border to my place. With Sandy on his way to ride Sam's herd. <laughs> we ain't got a thing to worry us, none. Yeah? <laughs> sure not. That masked gent in the engine will be swinging as soon as the sheriff gets here. What about them head we rustled? The poor's are busy changing brands. And they haven't sold at the same place in Mexico? Yeah, another couple of days that we moved along. Yeah, sure nobody suspicions it's us doing the wrestling? Positive, Worcester. Mighty convenient them two was captured. <laughs> they didn't put up no fight either. Had me plumb worried. For a second, while me and Sam was waiting, I figured it might be you coming back across the river. I ain't that foolish, Jeff. Well, I reckon I'll head back for my ranch. Hey, where'd Sam put them two hombres? Uh, you see the house right down below us? Yeah. In the back end, you can see it from here. The feed shed. Oh, yeah. Good thing Sam Curdy put bars on that shed. <laughs> yep, done it to keep bombers from getting in and stealing feed last winter. <laughs> I wonder how that masked man likes his jail. Come here. Oh. Look out the window, Kimasabi. 
See those two men near the ranch line? Uh, let me see them. Him? Yes, Tonto. The man on the black horse. Him, rustler. The one we saw on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande. Tonto, look. Coming from the ranch house. Regan. Yeah, what are you... Tell me, Cody, put you two in here? Forget that. But, mister, I you... told you not to mention that Tonto and I helped you last night. You haven't told anyone. No, like you said, mister, I kept shut up about it. But, but this here is different. Then never mind that, Regan. Who are those two men? Huh? Up there on the hill. Oh, that's Jeff, mister, top end here. The other fellow's Worcester. What about him? Regan, that man Worcester is a rustler who stole Curdy's cattle. What? You sure what you're saying? Tonto and I saw him on the Mexican side. That's right. Well, I'll be doggone. Mister, I better go to town and get Curdy, him and the sheriff. Oh, wait. Huh? And getting the sheriff will do no good, Regan. And Worcester hasn't been suspected before. Why should they take my word now? Oh, yeah, yeah. I hadn't figured that. What do you want me to do? Can you get back here tonight? I reckon so. As soon as it turns dark, come here. Make sure you do it before Curdy returns with the sheriff. Yeah. I'll tell you the rest later. But don't forget, Tato and I must be gone before the sheriff arrives. <laughs> Where you got him, Sam? I brought the sheriff and a posse, Gene. There ain't been no trouble. For land's sakes, I've been waiting and waiting. Sam, there's been a heap of trouble. Them two prisoners are gone. Well, what's that? Soon as it got dark. Curdy, I thought you said you had them safe. It ain't possible, Sheriff. Jane, you're loco. I ain't loco. You can look for yourself. The door's wide open. By gravy, it is. And the silver horse and the paint are gone from the corral, ain't they? Well, who done it? They couldn't have got out by themselves. Well, I don't know, Sam. Hold but on they got... there, Sam. I'll tell you who done it. Uh, what's that, Jeff? I saw it, Sam. It was Regan. Regan? You're a cowhand, Sam? Yeah, for you sure. Sure as I'm standing here. Regan opened the door, gave them their guns, and got their horses. I couldn't do nothing. It being three again one, I reckon Regan is as crooked as they are. Tarnation, I never figured Never mind that. the palaver, Curdy. Speak up, Jeff. Which way to head? Well, if you're looking for him, Sheriff, you might as well give up right now. They hightail out of here in an all-fired hurry. By this time, they clear across the Rio Grande into Mexico where the law can't touch them. <laughs> The yeah, river. The Rio Grande. Keep traveling and cross the ford. Misty, you haven't told me yet what you aim to do. Keep on. We'll discuss that on the other side. All right. Pull up. Rain your horse. We're in Mexico now, Regan. Here's where we part company. Yeah? Those rustled cattle are a mile ahead. Tato and I saw them early this morning. Ah, oh, one mile. Now, tell me once more, Regan. Just where is Worcester's Ranch? Why, well, it's right over that way. There's another ford across the Rio Grande there? Yep, leads right to his place. Very well. Now, I want you to turn around and head back for Curdy's place. Huh? Take it at a trot. I don't want you to get there too soon. But, mister, the sheriff and the whole posse is there. I know that, Regan. I want you to tell Sam Curdy that Worcester has rustled his cattle. I want you to convince that posse to go to Worcester's Ranch. But the cattle ain't there. They will be. Huh? They'll be there by the time the posse arrives. Now, you do your part and don't let anything stop you. And Tato and I will do ours. Adios. Come on, Silver. We're going after those stolen cattle. Get him up, Scout. Doggone, look at that fellow right. I don't know how he aims to move them cattle, but I reckon he's one fella that gets things done. Well, I reckon I better start moseying, too. Come on, horse. I hope that masked man don't run any more than he can handle. Behind the rustlers now, Tanner. Uh, uh, well, what do we do? There are four men guarding those cattle. We saw them before. That's right. You have the torches? Um, you got them. So we're going to light those torches and stampede the cattle right back across the Rio Grande. Right to Worcester's Ranch. Pull up. Their campfire. Well, the rustlers. Maybe they shoot, huh? They're not expecting anything, Tanner. We'll be on them before they're ready. Uh. Once those cattle start, we'll make sure they don't stop us out of Worcester's place. Now, light the torches. Uh, here, one. That's it. I'll take one and you take the other. Use your other hand for your gun. Leave the reins on Scout's neck. We can guide Silver and Scout with the knees. Now, ride. Come on, Silver. Get him up, Scout. Shoot into the air, Tonto. Stampede them.
Court and Thunder. Regan. Sheriff, Sheriff. Get the posse right. And the masked man says the stolen cattle at Worcester's place. What's that? Save him, grab him. Didn't Jeff tell you it was Regan let the masked man and the engine escape? Let go of me. Sure, I helped him get away. But it wasn't them done the rustling. Regan, talk and talk fast. I'm doing it. Sam, listen. That masked fellow in the engine saved my life last night. They saved me from the stampede with my horse here to go for a hole. They couldn't have done that and been doing the rustling at the same time. Speak your piece. I let them get away on account of they had a plan to get the rustlers. Which same you say is Worcester? Yeah, Worcester and Jeff. Regan, you sure sound straight. But I won't swallow that until I hear from Jeff. He's my top hand. He wouldn't do no rustling. Jeff? Hey, Jeff. Well, I reckon he ain't here. Well, I've seen him around before. Sam. Hmm? Sam, I just now recollect. After you and the sheriff come up here with a posse, you seen Jeff Lee. You did? Didn't strike me at the time, but he acted mighty secret about it. And what's more, he headed his horse for Worcester's place. Mm. Going mighty fast, too, like he was in an all fired hurry. Sam, you gotta come Regan, with me. You say no time for talk. I don't savvy if what you say is all correct. It is correct. But, but you can you... save it. Sheriff, the horse is outside, all saddled and ready. Call out your posse. We're heading for Worcester's ranch. Roll out, boys! Get your horse out here, boys! Get up! Get up! Get up. Get up. Don't sound so funny to me, Jeff. What did Regan let him get away for? And he went with him. Now, don't get head up, Booster. That's what I told the posse. I didn't see them gents escape, Savvy. But you said that... Sure. They... I figured as long as the masked man, the engine was gone, and Regan weren't around to deny it, why, it wouldn't do no harm to put him in a bad light, Savvy. Uh... Besides, maybe it's better for us. The posse didn't find them two. Might have been some embarrassing questions. You're right smart, Albrecht, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> this way, Sam and the sheriff, and everybody figures them are the rustlers. They got away, so that's all there is to it. You reckon it's best this way, huh? <laughs> I sloped over to tell you, Worcester. I ain't got no reason to worry about... <laughs> Jeff. Worcester, that sounds like cattle. Yeah. I haven't any cattle near the house. And where'd they come from? I don't like this, Jeff. Come on. What the... Worcester, them are Sam Curdy's cattle. I thought you had them across the Rio Grande. Sure, sure I did. Them was the cattle we rustled. How'd they get back here? I don't know. All right, Worcester, grab for the sky. Stand right where you are. Curdy. Jeff, it's Curdy and the sheriff. Where's my gun? Try that again and my bullet won't be into your gun, Jeff. The masked man. Mister, you sure can shoot. He hit his gun before he had down the holster. Now, Worcester, if you got an alibi, you better start spouting. Them there's my cattle. Last night they had my brand on them, and now they got yours. How come? Well, I... That is a... Ah, nothing to say, huh? How about you, Jeff? You got anything to say? Oh, Sam, I... You don't think I had anything to do with this? You don't think I rustled your cattle, do you? Jeff, I don't think so. I know so. And you know how I know? Because me and the sheriff and the whole doggone posse listened right here outside this door while you and Worcester was talking. We heard every word. Sheriff... You can take these hombres to the calaboose. Sam, I sure will. And as for you, Regan, from now on, you're foreman. Me, Mr. Curdy? Yeah, you. You're top hand, Savvy. I gotta thank somebody, don't I? And doggone his hide that there masked man don't stay around for nothing. Not even for a thank you. The story you've just heard is a copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated.
It's half past eight. Half past eight. It's half past eight, New York time. Time to wake up America and stump the experts. Each week at this time, Lucky Strike presents Information, Please. We stage a coast-to-coast quiz party and you furnish the questions. For every question we use, Lucky Strike pays out $10 plus a copy of the new Information, Please quiz book. If your question stumps us, you get $25 more plus a 24-volume set of the current Encyclopedia Britannica. Send your questions to Information, Please, 480 Lexington Avenue, New York City. If our editorial staff edits your questions a bit, don't fret over it. In case of duplication, Information, Please uses the question that was received first, and all questions become the property of Information, Please. And now, light up a lucky strike as I introduce our Master of Ceremonies, the literary critic of the New Yorker magazine, Clifton Fadiman. Mr. Fadiman. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, Information, Please is a completely unrehearsed, spontaneous, and ad-lib program. Uh, this is a cast-iron guarantee. Our quartet of experts this evening are the sports authority and memory wizard, John Kieran, the Conning Tower columnist of the New York Post, the irreplaceable Franklin P. Adams, the music critic, Deems Taylor, to whom in part we owe Walt Disney's famous Fantasia, and the author, foreign correspondent, and lecturer, Mr. Vincent Sheehan, whose most recent book is Not Peace, But a Sword. Remember, for each question missed, Lucky Strike rings up $25. And that's paid out to the sender, plus 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Well, suppose we start the proceedings this evening with a question coming to us from uh, that city of culture, Boston, Massachusetts, from R.G. Dakin. Name the characters of literature, gentlemen, whose costumes are described in these words. I have four of them. Get three out of four. Here's the first. Quote, The seat of his trousers bagged low and contained nothing. Who is that? I can give you no more hints than that. The seat of his trousers bagged low and contained nothing. Any ideas, Mr. Taylor? That's just a look of, uh, what, vacuous intensity on your face? Uh, Uh, Yes, I'm trying to visualize the uh, character. That's a very good description. It's a boy, and his name is Huckleberry Finn. And you'll find that description in The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. Well, that's one wrong. Now, here's another. I've got shoes with grown-up laces. I've got knickers and a pair of braces. Who's being described? Mr. Taylor. Christopher Robin. Christopher Robin. Very good. That's right. In uh, what book will you find that, Mr. Taylor? Uh, when we were very young. You feel pleased with yourself, Mr. Oh, Taylor? I'm delighted I with myself. I think that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's another very simple description of a costume. Quote, clothed on with chastity. Close quote. Clothed on with chastity. A simple costume. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Doesn't that be Adams, is it? No, no. Oh. <laughs> You're getting warm. <laughs> <laughs> on the contrary, I think it's a wild guess. <laughs> clothed on with chastity, Mr. Kieran? Well, I'll take a guess if nobody wants it. Galahad? No, no, it's a good guess. It uh, would be sort oh. of Galahad's opposite number. Mr. It might be Lady Godiva. It is Lady Godiva, yes. Clothed on chastity. You remember that yes, for the right. rest, her costume was she somewhat that horse, yes. exiguous. That's right. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid we have to count that wrong, because you came in just a little late, Mr. Taylor. Now, how but about... But I was thinking of Lady Godiva all the time. Well, you just couldn't get the words out of your mouth. Please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> quote, in a white petticoat, close quote. In a white petticoat. Who's being described? I think these are rather hard. Uh, Mr. Adams. I would guess uh, Little Nancy Etiquette. And you would be quite right. Little Nancy Etiquette in a white petticoat and a red uh, nose. The longer she stands, the shorter she grows. A candle. A candle, that's right. That gives us two out of four, which is not quite enough. And courtesy of Lucky Strike, that sends $25 to Mr. Dakin of Boston, plus a set of the Botanica. Now, here's a question from Edwin Chase of Lindhurst, New Jersey. This is a somewhat more serious question. Get three out of four if you can. Who owns these Mediterranean islands that have been mentioned in the news recently? The first island is the island of Rhodes. Who owns it? Rhodes. Uh, Mr. Sheehan. Italy. Italy, no question. Uh, Cyprus. Who owns Cyprus? Mr. England. Sheehan again. Big pardon? England. Great England, Britain. yes. And uh, the next one is Corsica, which is the only one I would know. Corsica. Who owns Corsica? Mr. Taylor? France. France. And finally, uh, Corfu. The island of Corfu, C-O-R-F-U. Who owns Corfu? Mr. Sheehan. 
Greece. Greece, yes. Well, that gives us four out of four. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Sheehan. Assisted by Mr. Taylor, playing on the piccolo. Miss Catherine Fowler of Illyria, Ohio, sends this one in. Name three women characters in literature who lured men to their deaths and explain how they did it. Give us a sort of elementary course in lure. Uh, Mr. Kieran. Well, there's a whole set of sirens who lured uh, the uh, sailors uh, in the Mediterranean. Yeah, how many sirens were there? You say a set of them. As if they were a deck of cards. Well, I don't know whether there were three or... How, think... many, how many do you have to name? Oh, you have to name three, but well, I'll... Well, there's three sirens. Yes, but I think... Uh... <laughs> I don't think that's fair. The sirens is a very good answer, Mr. Kieran, but I'm going to count the sirens as one. Well... Do you mind? Uh, give us two more women characters who did this luring business. Mr. Taylor. Uh, De Lorelei. Yes, the Lorelei. How many Lorelei were there? There was just one Lorelei. Just one Lorelei. She sat on a rock and sang and combed her hair. I yes. don't know why. But... Uh, because she had to be in the poem doing that. Also and, uh, in the public domain, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> what, what happened? Oh, yeah. What happened, Mr. Taylor, to the poor navigators? Well, they, they uh, ran up against her rock and were dashed to pieces. Yes. I mean, their ships were. That's right. Now, that gives us uh, two of these women characters. Let's have another. Who lured men to their deaths. Oh, uh, why, literature is full of them. Sudden deaths. Well, it can be lingering, if you <laughs> insist. <laughs> Mr. Karen? Uh, Scylla was a woman. She was changed into a rock. Yeah. That was hardly fair. Yeah, and she Scylla? lured mariners to yes. destruction. Yes, right. uh, if they missed her, they fell into Charybdis, which That's was right. the whirlpool. That's right. Right off the... Mainland of Italy. Now, you've given us two more, then. Scylla, Charybdis? Well, Charybdis wasn't a woman. What was Charybdis? Well, Charybdis was a whirlpool. <laughs> uh, don't whirlpools have sexes? <laughs> no. Scylla was, Scylla was the week. woman. Why well, do the... sailors always get into all this trouble? I don't trouble? know. I have no idea. Sailors seem to be out of luck. They uh, can't there's... swim. <laughs> there's Delilah, of course, who nagged Samson into revealing his secret, you remember, and shaved his head and so forth. And, uh, there was Clytemnestra. There was Judith. There was Circe in the Odyssey. There are a number of those that you could think of. The next question comes from Hermina Loeb of the city. Get two out of three. Now, you're going to listen to some music, gentlemen, very carefully. Uh, three parts of some compositions. Name the operatic character who dies to each piece of music, <laughs> whether slow or fast. You find this depressing? It's a jolly program. It is, it is. <laughs> this is our mournful night. Let's have the first. know it already? Oh, we have two hands. Mr. Sheehan and Mr. Taylor. Uh, Mr. Sheehan. Mr. Sheehan? The words are... I know the words. It's uh, Mimi. Yes, in, in what opera? In what opera? La Boheme. In La Boheme, yes. And she dies in what act? The last act. The last <laughs> act. Good. <laughs> I couldn't catch you on that one. That's very good, Mr. Uh, Sheehan. Who wrote La Boheme? Let's get the whole story. Puccini. Puccini. Very good. Now let's have the second. Uh... <laughs> more serious. Mr. Taylor. I think it's Boris Godunov. It is indeed. Very good. Boris Godunov, and he dies... Uh... Well, uh, as given at the Metropolitan, it's the last act. Yeah, it sounds as given like elsewhere, three. it's the next to the last act. You mean the one before Because it? the scene in the forest is frequently... It, it was the original last act. Is that so? But it is now transposed to be the next to the last you act. You follow yourself, don't you, Mr. Taylor? <laughs> oh, I do, yes. All right. That's good enough yes. for me. Uh, by the way, who wrote Boris Godunov, just to set us uh, clear? Modest Mussorgsky. Mussorgsky. Very good. Uh, those uh, strains, those lines of music describe the death of Boris Godunov. Now the third and last. <laughs> hey, Mr. Taylor again. Uh, Aida and Radames. They both die to the uh -huh. same piece of music? Yeah, they're buried much. alive. They're uh, entombed yes. alive. Aida in the opera. In uh, the opera Aida, good. oddly enough, and in the conventional last act. Very good. That gives us three out of three. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Here's another. This comes from Bernard Buchwald of this city. Get two out of three. Now, if uh, I asked you to name uh, a governor of New York State who was both a predecessor and a successor to the same man, you would probably say Al Smith, who uh, preceded Nathan Miller and then was elected after him in 1922. Now, can you name a man who was both predecessor and successor uh, to the same man uh, as a European monarch? Can you name a European monarch who preceded and succeeded the same person? I can't even get that sentence straight. Huh? <laughs> a European monarch... 
Yes. Uh, Mr. Sheehan. King Carroll. King Carroll? Uh, whom did he precede? His son. And succeeded him. Now, I think it was King Michael who succeeded... Uh, his, uh, King Michael succeeded his grandfather, Ferdinand. And Carroll, as crown, crown prince, uh, was, not, was not ruling at the time, wasn't he? That's wasn't right. He? It's the son that succeeded that's, the father. And that's right. And it is Michael. Father. You're all right, but one generation out. <laughs> now, uh, can you name a president of the United States who was both predecessor and successor to the same man? Mr. Kieran. Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland. Whom did he, uh, who was the man in between there? Uh, I think it was, uh, Harrison. H Harrison Benjamin is right. Harrison. Thank you very much. Yes, he succeeded, was succeeded by Harrison, and then again succeeded Harrison in 1893. Now, what British prime minister was both predecessor and successor to the same man? There are a few possible answers here. Uh, pick a prime minister, practically at random. A Disraeli. British prime minister. Mr. Taylor? Disraeli. Uh, Disraeli's perfectly all right. Gee. Very good, Mr. <laughs> Taylor. Disraeli uh, preceded Gladstone and succeeded him again. Didn't know I had it in me. Uh, neither did I. <laughs> uh, that gives you two out of three, gentlemen, and sends us on to a question from Guy D. Barr of Philadelphia. Here again, get two out of three. In what musical comedies or operettas are these people portrayed? The first person is Oscar Wilde. In what musical comedy or operetta would you find Oscar Wilde portrayed? Mr. Adams. Uh, supposed to be Patience. Supposed to be in Patience. And what's the name of the character in Patience who is supposed to be Oscar Wilde? Bunthorn. Bunthorn. Uh, in what musical comedy or operetta is Hodge Aleman portrayed? Hodge, H-A-D-J, Aleman, A-L-E-M-A-N. Uh, Mr. Sheehan. The Desert Song. Well, who is Hodge Aleman, Mr. Sheehan? Uh, he was a German who was in the Riff. Yes. Where is the 1925. Riff? 1925. Yes. How'd he get into the Desert Song from the Riff? I've forgotten the name of the man who wrote it, but... Uh, I, I don't know who, who wrote the Desert Song. Uh, uh, Sigmund who, Romberg. Sigmund uh, Romberg. He wrote the music. I don't know who wrote the book. Uh, what was the real name Nobody of ever writes the book of the music. So. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's the real name of Hodge Aleman, uh, Mr. Sheen, or did you tell us that? I can't remember. Well, it was, it was Joseph Clems, a useful piece of information that will stand you in good stead <laughs> sometime <laughs> in the future. Uh, how about uh, Louis XV? In what musical co comedy or operetta would you find him portrayed? Uh, Mr. Kieran. Du Barry was a lady. Du Barry was a lady, yes. Uh, what uh, actor took the part of Louis XV? Bert La. And what did he do with it? He kicked it around <laughs> wonderfully. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, that gives us three out of three, gentlemen. And so far, Lucky Strike has paid out $25 and one set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now enter Mr. Cross with what looks like a telegram. It is, Mr. Fadiman. This wire is from Richmond, Kentucky, and it's so typical of reports from tobacco markets all over the South that I wanted to, uh, want to read it to everyone. All it says is, Richmond, 25%. But here's what it means. At tobacco auctions in Richmond, Kentucky, so far this season, the American Tobacco Company has paid 25% more per pound for the tobacco it bought for its cigarettes and other tobacco products. Yes, 25% above the average market price paid for all the various types and grades of tobacco sold there. And the best we bought will go to Lucky's. Now, I could read you reports from market after market showing that Lucky Strike consistently pays higher prices to get the finer, lighter, the naturally milder tobaccos. It all comes down to this. You want a mild smoke. Lucky's have real mildness, bought and paid for at the auctions. So why not get together? Mr. Cross, you made your point in just 55 seconds. And now we'll uh, go on with a question from Zelma Rogerman of San Carlos, California. I don't know whether any of you gentlemen ever put things up for the winter, but I'm going to ask you to distinguish among jams, preserves, and jellies. Jams, preserves, and jellies. Very easy, Mr. Taylor. Well, uh, we edible, start uh, with jams. Mr. Kieran, what's, what is jam? Well, a jam is usually some kind of uh, macerated fruit, berries. Uh, uh, may I distinguish the three uh, on not? that basis? Why not? Uh, preserved, you would put up, you might put them up whole, as in the case of peaches, or, or have them. And uh, a jelly is, is uh, made in an entirely different way by uh, crushing the... Um, berries, as for instance cranberries, and straining them and... and uh, Through cheesecloth. That's right. <laughs> Don't forget the cheesecloth, Mr. Kerr. It isn't so much the, uh, the material that you put into the jars, it's the way that you put them in that makes them either jam 
preserves or uh, jelly. Fail, or fail to gel. Uh, very good. <laughs> I noticed Mr. Taylor listening with fascinated absorption to every word, Mr. Kieran. Uh, uh, then it's simply a question, Mr. Mr. Taylor. One addition. Jam is always, uh, always gets into your teeth. If you have teeth. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> You're thinking under raspberry your, jam. Under your plate if you haven't. <laughs> that's right. Uh, jelly is clear, made just with fruit juices. And uh, jam is made by... As you say, Jamming. macerating the fruit. Nobody can see that gesture. Uh, that's true. <laughs> Mr. Thank you. At any rate, in jam, you don't preserve the shape of the fruit, but you do preserve the fruit. In preserves, as Mr. Kieran pointed out, you uh, preserve the actual shape of the fruit. How about this one from Margaret Noltner of Milwaukee, Wisconsin? Get two out of three. Uh, behind whose throne, gentlemen, were these individuals very powerful influences? For example, Disraeli. Uh, was a powerful influence behind the throne of Queen Victoria. Now, uh, in the case of Cardinal Wolsey, what was the king uh, whom he influenced? Mr. Kieran. Why, I think that was uh, Henry VIII. Henry VIII, yes. Henry VIII of England. Now, in the case of Potemkin, Potemkin, uh, Mr. Kieran again. Catherine of Russia. Catherine of Russia, yes. Uh, in the case of Madame Pompadour, uh, what king did uh, she influence? Mr. Taylor? Louis Fourteenth and Fifteenth, I believe. I don't think she had that much staying power. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't. Uh, I, I think she just picked one king and stuck to him, Mr. Taylor. Well, uh, I would stick to uh, Louis Fifteenth. That's then. very good, Mr. Taylor. Exactly right. By that, uh, Pompadour. That's very good. That gives us three out of three. <laughs> Louis Fifteenth of France. Here's one from Deborah Ishlon of Brooklyn, New York. Now, you're going to hear some musical selections again, gentlemen. Identify the place referred to or described in each of these familiar musical selections. It says familiar on the card. I hope it'll be familiar to all of you. Get two out of three. Let's have the first. Uh, Mr. Sheehan and Mr. Taylor are giving each other the high sign. Mr. Sheehan. Paris. Paris, yes, the... Selection is from what? Manon. From Manon, yes. Uh, do you know in what act those... First. Uh, act one. That's very good, Mr. Shedd. Very good indeed. Now let's have the second. Who knows it? Is that your hand or your fist that you're holding it's out? my fist. I'd like Taylor? to come back to that. <laughs> Uh, like to have it again afterward? Yeah. Or do you want to hear it again now? No, no, I don't. All I don't right, we'll come back it. to it. Yeah. We'll come back to it. Let's have the third selection. <laughs> Any luck, gentlemen? Nobody ever lived there. Uh, <laughs> <this is> <laughs> Now, that selection that we've just listened to is from Rossini's The Italian in Algiers, and the place, gentlemen, would be what? Algiers. Good work, <laughs> Mr. Taylor. That's fun. Uh, that gives us one wrong. Now we're going to come back to selection number two. Oh, yes. Do you know it? Uh, the Hebrides. Oh, yes, the Hebrides. What's the selection? Uh, the Hebrides Overture of Mendelssohn. Yes, the, uh, from what uh, larger work? Or is it called Fingal's the, Cave? Uh, Fingal's Cave Fing or Fingal's Cave or Hebrides. Very good. Thank you. Uh -huh. That gives us uh, three out of three. Thank well, you very much. But who would live indeed. at Fingal's Cave? Uh, I beg uh, pardon? But nobody lives at Fingal's Cave. No, Hebrides Fingal does. All, right? <laughs> he, just, he just owns it. <laughs> That's right, Mr. Adams. Stick up for Fingal. <clears throat> the next question comes from Bernard Berry of Brookline, Massachusetts. I have three words here. I'm going to ask you to tell me what they mean, or rather, what is their derivation? Get two out of three. Anzac. What's the derivation of the word Anzac? Mr. Kieran. Australian New Zealand uh, Army Corps. Yes. It you was, put... uh, uh, originated in the last war. Yes. Uh, do they still call them Anzacs in the uh, well, present conflict? Well, uh, I believe they do. Yes. Mm -hmm. You uh, take the initials of, of those uh, uh, words and you get Anzac. That's right. Casey Stengel. How'd Casey Stengel get his name? Mr. Kieran again. Comes from Kansas City. Yes, Kansas KC. City or KC. That's right. What was Casey Stengel's real name? Charles H. Stengel, I believe. Charles H. Stengel. Uh, no one knows him by that name at all, I suppose, except Mr. Kieran. Uh, the derivation of the word Agpu. O G P U. Agpu. Any of you gentlemen know how uh, we get the word Agpu? Uh, Mr. Taylor? It's the initial of four Russian words meaning secret police. 
Uh, it's the, the, the initials of four Russian words, all right, but they do not mean secret police. The Russians would never be as direct as that. Mr. Sheehan, have you, can you help us out on that no, at all? I don't know what the words are. Well, I'll tell you what the English words are. The English words are all state political administration, which sounds perfectly harmless. And the Russians, you want the Russian, Russian words at all, Mr. Sheehan? Would you like to hear me uh, give you a little Russian? The initials of Obstje Gosudarstje Vienya Politeske Upravienya. That, uh, those are the Russian words. Well, Mr. Kieran? Why didn't you well, say they... so? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kieran? Don't the Russians uh, shorten it to gay pay Uh, no. Uh, that is another, another, uh, phrase meaning the same thing, I think. But uh, Agpu is the, is the uh, word they use over there. Well, that gives us two out of three, which is good enough, and sends us on to a question from J.R. Bailey of Wheaton, Illinois. I think this next one is a rather easy question. Uh, we have to get two out of three. In each of the following pairs of sports, which uses the larger ball? In the case of basketball and soccer, which uses the larger ball? Uh, Mr. Kieran? I'd say basketball. That's right. In the case of tennis and baseball, which uses the larger ball? Uh, Mr. Adams? I would say baseball. You would be right, Mr. Adams. In the case of golf and ping pong, which is the larger ball? Golf and ping pong. Mr. Taylor. I'll be a sport. I'll say golf. And you would be right, Mr. Taylor. Very good. I think the question is, however, is rather easy. Now, the next one comes from Ruth Cronk of Santa Barbara, California. See what you can do with this one. Oh, here we come back to Shakespeare, Mr. Kieran's favorite character. <clears throat> Name a character in Shakespeare who was engaged in each of these occupations. Uh, see if you can give me three out of four on this. The first is a drunken butler. A uh, drunken butler. We have two hands. Mr. Taylor? And Stefano. Stefano, yes. In what play? Uh, you know, uh, I don't know. The you Tempest. Tell me. The Tempest, yes. Stefano in The Tempest was a drunken butler. No, but Malvolio. Oh, I beg pardon, Mr. Shin. Malvolio. Oh, Malvolio didn't drink. No, he's a Puritan. Oh, he didn't drink. He didn't smoke. <laughs> That's right. He didn't do practically anything, did he, Mr. Kier? He was the <laughs> fellow who thought because uh, he was virtuous, there was to be no more cakes and ale. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> You find it difficult to distinguish between sobriety and drunkenness. <laughs> <laughs> now, in uh, in Shakespeare, who was a tailor? A tailor. Uh, only one tailor in Shakespeare, as far as I know. Gentlemen? Uh, somebody Mr. Adams? in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. That's right. Which one? Right. I forget his name. Well, you read about right, him last night. You've got the right play, all right. What was the name of the tailor? Uh, any of you remember the Was it uh, uh, Snout? No, I think Snout with this. It does indeed, but it wasn't Snout. I'm not sure. I think Snout was a tinker. Starveling is the tailor. Starveling. Starveling is the tailor. I'd like to count that right, Mr. Adams, but I'll have to count it wrong because you didn't give me the exact name. Now, who was a professional wrestler in Shakespeare? Mr. Kieran. I believe his name was uh, Charles. Yes, but as a sports yeah. expert, you deserve no credit for knowing no, that, of course, Mr. Kieran. He wasn't a very good wrestler, either. <laughs> in what play? In As You Like It. In As You Like It. That's quite right, Mr. Kieran. Thank you. Now, who in Shakespeare was a poet? Of course, practically all the characters are poets if they talk in blank verse. Mr. Kieran again. Well, Orlando was a poet, <clears throat> and as you like it, he uh, hung a lot of uh, sonnets. On, yes, but he was uh, he was an amateur, amateur poet. poet, wasn't he? Rather than a professional. Mr. Sheehan? Sinner in Julius Caesar. Very good. Yes, that's the one I was thinking of. Sinner is a professional poet, one who makes a bad living at it. That gives us uh, three out of four. Belongs to the author's league. How about this one? Uh, this comes from George M. Crawford of Westport, Connecticut. Neighbor of yours, Mr. Adams. It's a question about things that are new. Get two out of three if you can. What is the new order in Japan? The new order in Japan. Oh, give us a rough approximation of what it might be. Uh, none of you gentlemen have heard of the new order in Japan? Well, it's a phrase used sort of loosely to refer to the new internal policy or foreign policy as it affects Asia. I suppose it's Japan's idea of what's going to happen if she does win the war. That's one wrong. Now, what is the new life in China? The new life in China. Mr. Sheehan. Uh, it's a movement which uh, is sponsored by Madame Zhang Kai-shek. Yeah. Uh, which is semi-Christian, I think. Uh, or perhaps altogether Christian. Uh, what are some of the tenets of the, uh, of the movement, would you say? What, what, uh, what do the new lifers advocate? Well, virtues of a large general order... Of course, that's rather safe and sound, yes. Uh, specifically, though... Self-sacrifice. Well, yes, the reconstruction of cities along modern lines is something even more specific than that. 
the adoption of Mandarin as a national dialect, I believe, yes. is another of the things that the new lifers in China uh, advocate. Now, the new economic policy in Russia means or meant what? The new economic policy in Russia. Uh, Mr. Sheehan again. It was, in 1921, the policy uh, of going back to a limited form of capitalism. Yes. Uh, who advocated it? Lenin. That's quite right. That gives us two out of three. See what you can do with this one. Uh, this uh, question is about angry ladies in literature. It comes from Ethel Ross of Wichita Falls, Texas. Get two out of three. Where in literature does an angry woman destroy each of the following? The first is a lute. Where does an angry woman destroy a lute in literature? That seems to me a very hard question indeed. I don't see why anybody should remember it. It's in Greek uh, legend, isn't it? No, I don't think so. Probably Shakespeare. Uh, you're right, Mr. Taylor. What a guesser you are, Mr. Oh. Taylor. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, guess... Intuition, it isn't guessing. You're marvelous, Mr. Kieran. It's in The Taming of the Shrew. That's right. And what's the name of the angry lady in The Taming of the uh, Shrew? Kate. Yes. Sweet Kate. Yes, Kate. <laughs> I call her Catherine, but you've probably known her longer than I have, Mr. Kieran. Uh, she breaks a lute over the head of her music teacher. Now, uh, who destroys a painting which has just been completed? What angry woman destroys a painting that's just been completed? Uh, Mr. Taylor. Uh, Bessie in The Light That Failed. Very good indeed. That, now, that's a tough one. She yeah, destroys was. the, the, the put painting. I a lot of work in on that. That's very good. <laughs> and who destroys a beautiful house? An angry woman who destroys a beautiful house. Craig's wife, maybe? No, no. Oh. Uh, the answer is uh, the housekeeper, Mrs. Danvers, in Rebecca, which was a motion picture also. Remember, she burns down the beautiful house. Oh, yes, house Judith of, Anderson burned of, the house down. Amanda Lay, that's yeah. right. That sends $25, courtesy of Lucky Strikes, Ethel Ross, plus a Britannica. And now, for just a moment, Mr. Cross is going to take my place. The expert he wants to fire questions at is Mr. Speed Riggs, well known tobacco auctioneer. Mr. Riggs, information, please. Just who are the independent tobacco experts? Well, they're tobacco men not connected with any cigarette company, like auctioneers, warehouse owners and operators, and independent buyers. And they deal with all cigarette companies on an equal basis? Yes, they do. And they have a reputation for being fair and square. That's what makes them a success in the tobacco business. Thank you, Mr. Riggs. Ladies and gentlemen, these independent experts are present at every auction. They know just who buys what tobacco. And they're as free to choose their own cigarette as you or I. They see Lucky Strike pay the price to get the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder tobaccos. And they smoke Lucky's two to one. Won't you profit by their example? Next time, ask for Lucky Strike. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Now, Lucky Strike's losses for this week are $50 and two sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Thank you, Mr. Taylor, for coming to Lucky Strike's party this evening. Now, next week, Mr. Kieran and Mr. Adams will again be with us, and we announce the return engagement of the distinguished attorney and New York State Congressman, Kenneth Simpson, and as our special guest, Judge James G. Wallace of the New York Court of General Sessions. Remember, for every question we use, whether or not it's answered correctly, the sender gets $10. If the question stumps our experts, you not only get $25 more, but in addition, the complete 24-volume set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Send letters with questions and correct answers to information, please, 480 Lexington Avenue, New York City. And now a parting message from Mr. L.A. Speed Riggs, famous tobacco auctioneer of Goldsboro, North Carolina. <laughs> And that chant, fully interpreted, ladies and gentlemen, means Lucky's pay higher prices for the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder tobaccos. With independent tobacco experts, auctioneers, buyers, warehousemen, with men who know tobacco best, it's Lucky's two to one. This is the National Broadcasting Company. And that's the way it was on January 3rd, 1941. Come back for our next upload where we spotlight January 4th, 1941. My name's Henry Chop. I'm your host. And if you are enjoying these trips back in time, please subscribe to this channel and click on that bell icon. And if you want to get more details about 
this specific date or any specific date that we are going through and uh, listening to radio programs, go to our World War II newspaper page and you will be able to listen to a long hour to 90 minute long newscast of what was going on that day uh, uh, worldwide, national wise, uh, and uh, Chicago wise, because I'm from Chicago, and uh, sports wise. You will sometimes we even delve into show business and uh, what movies we're playing downtown. In fact, that's what we're going to do tomorrow on that channel because uh, uh, it represents a Saturday. And what we are going to have uh, on this on this uh, channel. Uh, will be Jungle Gym and Front Page Drama, only two 15-minute programs, so it will be a rather short upload. But you know what? With it uh, being a Saturday represented, you never know. I might be able to uh, find a movie that was playing it uh, at that time in Chicago, and if I can, I will uh, present it after tomorrow night's old-time radio broadcast. We will see what's going on. So uh, please subscribe to this channel. It helps uh, keep me motivated, keeps me going, and sub subscribe to the newspaper channel. Uh, that keeps me motivated and keeps me going. And as we get to historic dates, you will definitely want to hear that, especially because not every historic date has a radio newscast uh, attached to it, unfortunately. I can think of a few off the top of my head that I do not have any in my collection yet. You know what? You'll be able to hear it via the newspaper. So uh, until then, like I said, I'm Henry Chop. Let's turn off this old tube radio. That's our time machine. Good night. God bless. This changing world, this changing scene, where is it taking us? What does it mean? As long as we're certain of each other We know we don't have to be afraid These changing times we rise above we have no time for them We have our love And love is the only thing That still remains the same Through all this change